Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about how to create a new you. I'm delighted to welcome special guest, David Edwards. David has an MBA in healthcare administration and has served lower income people on three continents over the last 35 years. He is also the author of New You, who knew, which won the Literary Titan Gold Award in April, 2022. You can reach David and learn more about his book at his website, davidredwards.com, and I'll include a link in the description. Welcome, David. I'm so glad that you could join with me today. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. I am excited to be learning from you. And I understand that you are here, you're this high paid CEO of this community health center. And then you have this aha moment that inspired you to quit your job and write a book. And so I'm just on pins and needles. What happened? What was this aha moment? And then I would love to talk about your book. Awesome. Well, we all have a story, don't we? And so, as you mentioned, I was a servant leader at a community health center. It was a rural area, uh, lots of agriculture. And I had been there about four years, and we had been very fortunate. I worked with some amazing people. They were very committed to the mission. They were thoughtful. Um, and we had doubled in size during that time, and we had outgrown our original health center building. And so we had enough money finally that we could actually go to the bank and say, hey, could we borrow money and build a new health center, which was really cool. Something that people had wanted to do for a long time there. And we were excited to not just build another building, but to do something that would maybe be evolutionary, perhaps even revolutionary, something that would really take things to the next level. Our model that we had created put you, for example, Linda, if you're the patient, okay. you're the center, you are the focus. And all of the people like the doctors, the dentists, the therapists, the coaches, the community health workers, the nurses, the et cetera, et cetera, we had this broad group of people flex their schedule around what your needs are. Whoa, for real? For real. And you are expected to be the captain of the care team because we realize that when you come into the health center, you're only there for a little while and the rest of your life, you know, you got to manage stuff outside of the clinic. And so we realized that we were building a new building. It was built around it was or to support this patient centered model where we had integrated teams. And it wasn't like the doctor's the captain of the team or the therapist, whoever has the most letters behind their name. That wasn't how we worked. You, the patient, are the captain of the care team. And so we wanted to build the, everything. So the information systems, the full workflow, we were doing cool stuff like biophilic design, which nobody's ever heard of that, but this idea that when you walk into our health center, most likely you've got a problem that you're looking for some help with. So this isn't your best day probably, and maybe you're a little stressed. And this is well-documented in healthcare, right? When we go to the doctor, the dentist, whatever, our, our anxiety is a little elevated, right? We're a little on edge. So what we wanted to do, and this is what biophilic design helps you do. This is a total aside, but anyway, <laughs> anyways, um, what it does is when you walk in, the setting is very natural and very relaxing. So the colors, the use of different textures, nature, bringing nature into the health center, you walk in and it's like, oh yeah, okay, I'm gonna be all right. And so we had all this cool stuff we were doing. And my first, it was actually two epiphanies or two wows. So my first wow was, wow, you know, we're going to spend $16 million and build this new health center. We've got a great model that we had, for example, eliminated any disparities in health outcomes between our majority population and our largest minority population. No difference at all. If you're diabetic, if you're depressed, if you are whatever, any of our core measures, you had as good of a health outcome as the majority population. And we were really proud of that. And we thought we're going to take this to the next level. 
but I realized since you are the captain of the team and not me, the CEO or the doctor or the therapist or the whoever, right? If we don't help you develop the skills to fulfill that role effectively, then we're going to greatly limit our effectiveness, right? The amount of difference that we're going to make will be much, very much more limited. And so that was the first epiphany. And so I was talking to my, this multidisciplinary team and I was saying, you know, if they're going to be the captain, what do we got to do, right? What, what does that even mean? Because we used the words, but we didn't really define them. And so I started this journey and um, it, I had the second epiphany. <laughs> I was studying change models, right? So life is all about change. It was keeping up with the external change, like how to make a Zoom call, how to do email, how to text your kids, you know, because they won't talk to you otherwise or whatever. You know, we got to keep up with that stuff, which is great. And it is important. But frankly, even more important is the internal change. You know, this idea of who am I becoming, right? If I'm becoming a new you, which I guarantee you are, who's in charge of the process, right? Have you ceded that to all these other influences outside of your life? So some working for your best interests, some not, some in the middle. But who is guiding this development, this evolution of who you are becoming inside which of course becomes the strength of how you then interact with and benefit from all of the change that's going on outside of you as well. So that internal change becomes even more important. So I was ch studying change models and this wow that came was at the core of every change model, it doesn't matter which university or which researcher was talking about it, is personal motivation. And so I'm thinking, you know, I used to like to listen to cassette tapes. Remember what those are? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I would stick a Zig Ziglar cassette tape in and he was a wonderful man and he'd get me all pumped up or Brian Tracy or whoever, right? These were great. But that wasn't internal motivation, right? This internal motivation comes from inside of you, not from outside influences or resources. And so I started to say, I started to study, well, what is that, right? What are the components of it? Because if you are going to be the captain of the care team, and really by extension, and since the skills that I discovered and the principles are applicable to all domains of life, work, home, your health care, physical health, mental health, hobbies, education, relationships, right, across all of our various complicated and complex human domains, these principles apply equally well. And that was really an amazing thing. And so I, like you said, I left my job. Um, I started a little business partnering with other health centers to um, do affirmations of these principles as a very simple, very inexpensive thing that would have just a little bit of like daily influence. Um, and I just got it up and going and started reaching out to my friends and the little thing called COVID <laughs> slapped us in the oh, face. Oh yeah, that thing, that got you too, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so my friend said, Dave, that sounds interesting, but you know, I've got this long list of things to remain viable and, you know, talk to me in a couple of years. And, and so I went out till I failed, I guess. Um, I continued to read, I continued to write, I continued to research, did a bunch of YouTube videos. I thought, well, I'll take it to the public, right? Instead of business to business, I'll go business to consumer. And um, I failed. <laughs> There's the short of it. I just could not make it work and become, you know, like a viable, a viable thing. Uh, and so I realized I got enough stuff here. I could probably write a book. And so I continued to research and it was really the best thing I could have done because built on those other two failures, I had enough information finally to kind of pull together. And I hadn't really identified the 10 principles. I had wrote about them, but I did, couldn't really like say, this is a distinct 
principle. And these are some skill sets underneath that principle. And so writing the book, which took me about a year, um, and I just published in January, really where I put all of the stuff and it just coalesced in a beautiful way. And so these principles, starting with our values, not a vague sense of our values, right? So if we think of a vague sense of our values, which is what about 80% of us enjoy, it's like saying, I am hungry for Mexican food. And if you leave it at that, that's okay, but it isn't going to get you very far, most likely. You're probably not going to solve your hunger problem. But if you are explicit about it and you say, I'm hungry and Mexican food sounds good, and the cantina is just three blocks away, and they're still open, and they have a special tonight, and I can walk there before they close, and I got enough money to pay for this. Um, so I'm going to do that, right? All of a sudden, that idea becomes actionable. It becomes effective. It becomes powerful in your life. So in this first principle, I talk about taking your values. Instead of having this vague sense of this is important and that's it's not, you identify your top five core values. Be careful when anybody uses a verb like identify because there's work <laughs> that goes along with that. But for our purposes, right, I'll just say, and it's really a simple process, but you identify your top five core values. You define them, step one. You then, you talk about what would it look like to live consistent with that? You know, what are my behaviors? What are my actions like if I was living that? And then that's step two. And then step three is why am I better off? You know, why is my life better off for actually living this value, right? So you've identified the top five, you answer those three questions, all of a sudden your values move from a vague thing that doesn't have a lot of power to something that, and to my great surprise, modern scientists, you know, psychologists and psychiatrists and neuroscientists and all these smarter people than me have done this research. And they say, if you will do these things, which only takes a couple of hours and it's free, imagine that, it will help you have more meaning in your life it will help you have more focus. It will have you tend to well-being, which is the sense that my life is on track. It's going okay, right? I'm not perfect. It, it doesn't solve all your problems. It doesn't pay your bills, frankly, sorry. It won't make you a millionaire, but you will feel like I am okay, right? And if you have these things, you're gonna have more confidence. You're gonna have greater belief in yourself. And you have all these positive things from just this first simple principle of 10 and the preceding or the following nine, the following nine all build on that first one. And they fall under two general categories. The first is a word that I'll never use again, but self-efficacy, because nobody understands what that is and nobody uses that terminology. But self-efficacy is a set of principles that helps you exercise control over your life. Instead of being a pawn to all the various influences, you get to exercise control over your life so that it's moving in the direction that you want to. And this last set of principles of the three then have to do with self-compassion. So self-compassion, again, is very strongly, amazingly actually well-researched. Self-compassion, you can think of as the balance to self-efficacy. So on a foundation of values, which again, I like to use this natural metaphor, which is like the roots of a tree. So you've got these roots and then this trunk, self-efficacy and self-compassion, those principles keep you in balance. So you don't become an overperforming jerk or an underperforming, really nice person, right? You've got this balance of both. You feel connected to people. You're able to engage with them. You are effective at the same time. You get more done, but in balance. 
And what happens then is you got the strong roots, you've got the strong trunk, and the natural thing without a lot of tips and tricks and hacks and other stuff is that you will, just like a fruit tree, right? You will produce more. You will have this bounteous harvest because you are set up and designed to create that outcome. And it's not a lot of extra work because it's just what naturally happens when you align up all these principles that create the foundation of your personal motivation. It's really, I, I couldn't hardly believe how elegant it was when it kind of all pulled, came, came together for me. That is so amazing. And I loved as you're talking about your description about working from that 80% of I'm hungry, Mexican food sounds good. And then that little bit extra that gets you over the edge into the actually doing it. And I think that that makes all the difference, being able to make that last little bit. I believe that change comes from learning and doing. And so by getting it to that next step of being able to say, hey, I've got some money. There's the store. I can walk over. I can grab a bite to eat. Makes the difference. I love that. And being able to change the idea into maybe not running on our, I loved when you said, you know, who basically who, who's in the driver's seat here? And I love that, that model of putting a person in the hub. And with that kind of responsibility, there are many people who would enjoy that. And there are a lot of people who absolutely are terrified by that idea, because that means, you know, I'm accountable to me. I can't blame somebody else. I can't you know, just sit here and, and let somebody else take care of me. And I love that in your, your self-care model where you have your doctors and you have things, having that model just sounds ideal. And then when we're working on this kind of autopilot, our subconscious, which we do 95% of the time, um, it's not very good person in charge. You have to go to that conscious and think about things. So that is absolutely delightful. What a wonderful thing. So you're saying I can change my life in a couple of hours. I think you can, recognizing that this is a lifelong journey, right? Wherever you are, whoever's listening or watching to this, right? You could be 18, you could be 80, and it doesn't really make any difference. It doesn't make any difference if you're rich or poor, if you're educated or not. If you are street smart or book smart, it doesn't matter if you're white or black or Asian or what Caucasian, it doesn't, all of these external things really don't matter because these are principles, just like gravity and lift determine whether you're going to lift, get the plane up off the ground, right? You got to pay attention to those principles because it's just how the natural laws work. And it's the same thing for human beings. There are natural laws that determine how we work. And as we align our lives with these principles, we find things just go a little better. And again, I'm not talking about getting rich and I'm not talking about getting famous. I'm talking about you as a person evolving as the captain of your own ship, of your own life, over your lifetime, slowly, consistently, through struggles and trials, which are inevitable, and having the resilience and the perseverance to get through those things and continue on your journey successfully, effectively growing and becoming a new you. I mean, who knew? So it gives me the tools that I need, but I still have to build the new me. That is yeah. that me. So if I'm in the driver's seat, if I'm the one, then I still have to put in the effort, right? You do. And my book is designed for really regular folk. <laughs> it's who I've served my entire career. And, and that's who I feel this connection with. Um, and frankly, as regular folk, we've got to get more done with less help. So aligning with those correct principles really makes a huge difference. It makes our lives much, much more meaningful, successful. Um, and anyways, Again, I get, I get off on these tangents. I apologize. And so, so it's really useful for anybody, anybody in your audience, young, old, these principles apply equally well. And, and I love what you're talking about because so the, the second principle is intent. The third one is 
I'm sorry, the second principle is awareness. The third principle is learning. And the fourth principle is intent. And you can kind of see how these build on each other, right? You're creating like stair steps, which make you more and more capable. They elevate your capacity, your ability along this journey. So do I go through those steps of the defining and then the behavior and the act? Do I do that for each of the 10 things or was that just the first part? Just the first part. Yep. And again, that first, it sounds like a lot when we talk about it, but most people can do the entire process in a couple of hours. And I recommend breaking it up. So some of, um, some of your audience they don't have a lot of focus, right? Maybe they can only get in 20 or 30 minutes in a shot. It might take you three or four times, you know, little sessions to kind of get through the process. But the beautiful thing about it is just by putting forth the effort, whatever it is, don't ever knock yourself down, whatever your attention span is. It simply is what it is. So you build from where you're at and you don't worry about it. And if your neighbor can concentrate for an hour, good for them. They're your neighbor. They're not you. And don't worry about it. You look at, think about yourself. And if it's 10 minutes or an hour, whatever, it just is what it is. And so don't stress about it, but schedule those times within a couple hours of effort. You can have that done and you've got this great foundation, right? You've planted the seed and the roots are growing. And then you just take the next principle and say, okay, what is something out of this? And there's always a number of different skills I never tell you to do one or the other. I present these ideas and I invite you to think, because you're the captain, what of these is going to be useful for me? And I urge you to only choose one at a time and then try it. You apply it and you try it and you give it some time. Remember what did Benjamin Franklin do? He identified his 12 principles or values and he spent a month on it and then he worked on the next one, right? And he just proceeded over time. So I think it just makes sense. You take little changes, little tiny things, you apply them. And over the course of time, just like when we exercise and we build muscle, right? And then we're stronger and we have more stamina. What happens is if it's really tough to focus for 20 minutes even, by exercising a little bit each day, this doesn't take over your life. It's not like the only thing in your life. This is one small thing that you prioritize for you because you're worth it, but it builds this prefrontal cortex, right? And the build pathways, just like we build muscle. And by spending a few minutes every day, the pathways get stronger and stronger. They get bigger and more robust. And amazingly, in a very short amount of time, they say an hour of effort can double the number of neurons in a given course or pathway. So you think about over a course of a month, if you spent 10 minutes a day, roughly, well, 60 minutes. So, you know, three hours, roughly, maybe close to four, you could quadruple the pathways in your brain that you've been focusing on. For example, working on your values. What happens then where maybe you struggled with it at first because you're exercising a little bit every day, you build the pathways, and by the end of a month, it's a little more natural. You don't have to think about it as much. It just is there, right? Because you're exercising your mind. And that really is the key to being the captain of your life. A little bit every day, consistent with these enduring principles, you exercise your mind. And over time, you just become naturally and normally, without any extraordinary effort, without any degrees or big expense, you become the captain of your life. And what an amazing, wonderful, I think about, I love your show, Motivate, Lift, Inspire, right? You can lift yourself by aligning with these principles and make a much more inspiring life. And again, not to be rich or famous, but to feel successful, to feel effective, to feel connected and to feel balanced, that is a successful life. Indeed. And to feel fulfilled and to have meaning. And that was one of the things that you brought up is this process helps people to feel like they have meaning and purpose in their life. And that makes really all the difference. So I love that this is geared toward anyone. It sounds like an equalizer. 
So if I am very poor and if I've had a rough life getting started, I can still do this and, and learn the skill set that maybe I didn't get from watching the people around me. Maybe it wasn't modeled in my home or in my associates, but I can get and learn those, those skills because it is a skill set. And we typically learn from our, our family, from our peers, and whatever we see is normal. That's what we're used to. That's the way that things are. And if we're happy with that, I guess we can keep going. But if we want to change, I think it's lovely that there's a way to get the tools to be able to, to be successful in that. Awesome. And then we that's don't exactly, get stuck. That's exactly right. You're exactly right. That's a lovely summary. That is so cool. So would you mind giving me kind of a specific thing, say pick one of the values and what would I have to do? What would be an action that I would have to do to make it even, we've talked more in general, I would love to hear kind of a specific thing so that I can hear it and say, oh, that's it. Oh, I can do that. So one of my favorite, and again, I'm never going to tell you what to do in the book. I don't, but I'll offer this as an idea. Perfect. And I love this idea. So if I have an apple and you have an apple and we exchange apples, how many apples do each of us have? We each have an apple. Right. So we started with one apple and we ended with one apple. What's beautiful about a podcast like yours is if I have an idea and you have an idea and we exchange ideas, how many ideas do each of us have? Two. Exactly. We have both benefited. It is a win-win. So as, a, as an offering of a win for your audience, the second principle, because I want to start with the early principles, because again, they build, is awareness. And a wonderful, easy practice that any of us, any of us I think, can apply is in the morning, I will exercise the fourth principle, which is intent. What is my intent for the day? I really encourage you to write it down, but you don't have to, but I think it's really helpful. And this might be a little, little bit like a to-do list, right? Today, I'm going to go to work. I got to pick up eggs on the way home, right? This is my intent. But more important, as the captain of your life, you might think about, especially if you've gone through this exercise of making your values explicit, you might say, today... I'm going to be more courageous because that's a value that I want to develop. And so you in the morning say, my intent is to be courageous. This is who you are becoming. And you ident you've identified it. You've talked about what it looks like. And you've talked about why your life is better off for living it, right? So you say, this is my intent. You might think about some things that are going to happen. I'm going to talk to this guy who maybe wasn't nice to me or, you know, whatever it happens to be. And at the end of the day, I'm accountable, right? So it's in the morning, I'm an intentional. And in the evening, I'm accountable. And again, this doesn't take over your day. You sit down, I urge you to be as much as possible in a quiet place where you can think, <coughs> excuse me, and you say, how did I do? My intent was to get these things done, right? So you can look at your to-do list and see what you got done and what you didn't. You might move some things over. You might eliminate some things. You might say, oh, that's ridiculous. And you're going to put it out three days, whatever. That's always a good process as a part of doing, right? But then as you look at who am I becoming, if I'm going to be more courageous, for example, how did I do? When somebody said something that offended me or that concerned me, did, was I courageous? Did I stand up, right? When somebody suggested something that I think is wrong, did I mention, or was I courageous? And you kind of be accountable. And it doesn't take a long time. You can do this in literally five or 10 minutes. And the next morning you get up and say, oh, what's my intent? In the evening you say, I'm accountable for what my intent was. And you practice this every day, literally, this takes 10 to 20 minutes in a day. So out of 24 hours, can you find 10 to 20 minutes to be intentional about your life and who you're becoming and what you want to get done and then be accountable for it? 
it is a beautiful foundational kind of practice that helps you with all the other principles. And it turns the day into a little sandwich. There you go. A little bit in the morning and a little bit in the evening. And then the whole filling of the day should be a little bit better. And especially over time. So the, the ninth principle or the eighth principle is self-kindness. There's a tidbit. When you beat up on yourself because when you're accountable, either through the day or at the end of the day, you know, you messed up. I know that's never happened for you, but uh, oh, no. No, no, never. Actually, <laughs> daily. <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, when we beat up on ourselves, what happens in our mental processes is our ability to do better, right? To improve on that is decreased. Mm. And when we then instead learn, right? This is an exercise we can learn each day to be kind to ourselves like a close friend might be. So I messed up or your best friend messed up or a family member you really care about messed up and they call you on the phone and say, ah, I messed up. Do you say, well, you're a moron. I can't believe you did that. What a dummy, right? And then you hang up the phone. Oh, that's what I always do. No, I know, exactly. no what I would say is, oh, well, you tried. Try again tomorrow. It'll be all right. Exactly. So we learn to say this to ourselves. And you know what? When we do that, our capacity to actually do it, to do better, to learn from it, goes up. There's a delightful movie with uh, Tom Cruise and Cameron Diaz called Night and Day. Mm -hmm. And there's this scene where he says, with me, here, without me, there, with me, here, without me, there. So I think it's a <laughs> lovely visual on with self-kindness, my ability is up here. With beating myself up, my ability is down here. Self-kindness beating me up. Self-kindness, right? And then we learn and we practice. And again, you're developing these pathways. And after months, I don't know, it doesn't matter how long it takes, right? It only matters that you do your best and that over time you realize that I am more consistent and you will get better and better and better. And that's one of the reasons why it's important not to focus on 10 things, because that could be tempting. You might pick up the book, read all 10 chapters and go, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this and this and this and this. And that. Sorry, that just doesn't work for 99.9% .9 of the people. Pick a single thing, you work on it, develop the pathways, it becomes natural. You pick up the next thing. You've got your entire life. So enjoy it, take advantage of it, be the captain. Oh, I love that. David, thank you. Thank you for visiting with me today and for sharing your wisdom and for pulling it together so that people can have that, that equalizer and be able to have that tool and resource to be able to be the captain of their life. So thank you. I thank you so much. You. Yeah. In closing, I'd like to share a quote by Jubin Natio. He said, I am the master of my fate and I am the captain of my boat. While ups and downs are a part of everyone's journey, how you face it makes you the person or artist you are. See you next time on Linda's Corner. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of Linda's Corner, please share and subscribe to help us reach new listeners. I also invite you to check out my nonprofit, Hope for Healing, at the website hopeforhealingfoundation.org for free ebooks, free audiobooks, and other free resources to help increase happiness, build confidence and self esteem, strengthen relationships, manage stress, and calm feelings of depression and anxiety. I also invite you to grab a copy of one of my books, like Crushed A Journey Through Depression, or Amazon bestseller You Got This an action plan to calm fear, anxiety, worry, and stress. See you next time on Linda's Corner.